friends, welcome to Online Worship this weekend. My name is Lindsay Beaulieu. I am the Director of Operations here at First Presbyterian Church in Morganton, North Carolina. Today is the fourth Sunday of Lent. Lent is a time of preparation and repentance, reflection and prayer leading up to Resurrection Sunday. I want to share a few announcements with you this week. Over the past week, our session met and approved new CDC guidelines for indoor masking and social distancing using a red, yellow, green system. It's specific to our county and will likely change from week to week. So we will add that information to our weekend email so that you'll know what to expect when you arrive for worship. Also, I want to let you know that every year, FPC has scholarships that are available for graduating high school seniors and for college students and we are now in the process of accepting applications for those scholarships. The material should be in your email inbox to apply, but you can also contact the church office if you need a copy and we'll be glad to help you with that. Friends, we're so glad that you're here to worship online with us. It is my prayer that you will encounter God as we worship together. So let's be called into worship today. Incline your ear and come to me, God says to us. Listen so that you may live. God's covenant is everlasting. It is with us from generation to generation. God's love is steadfast and true. We come together today in God's presence to call on the Holy One and draw near. So let us offer our worship and praise. Let us pray. Reconciling God, you bring all of us to yourself through the power of your Son, Jesus Christ. Our mistakes may be large or small, intentional or not, but no matter our iniquity, your love always runs to meet us on the road. Refresh us with your Holy Spirit, renew us with the love of Christ Jesus, and refocus us so that we might bring our whole being into worship today. Amen.
Friends, our first reading is from Joshua chapter 5, verses 9 through 12. The Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away from you the disgrace of Egypt. And so that place is called Gilgal to this day. While the Israelites were camped in Gilgal, they kept the Passover in the evening on the 14th day of the month in the plains of Jericho. On the day after the Passover, on that very day, they ate the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain. The manna ceased on the day they ate the produce of the land, and the Israelites no longer had manna. They ate the crops of the land of Canaan that year. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the Lord is a refuge and fortress for us, protecting us from evil. Trusting in God's mercy, let us confess our sin together using the prayer on your screen, followed by a brief moment for your personal prayers and mine. Church, let's pray together. We confess to you, O God, that we have been tempted by evil and have succumbed to sin. You nourish us with your eternal word, but we hunger for bread that perishes. You call us to worship you alone, but we seek to serve worldly powers. You offer us salvation, but we gamble with the gift of life. Forgive us, God of grace. Guide us by your word and guard us with your spirit so that we may live in faith and follow you faithfully through Jesus Christ, our Savior. God, hear now the prayers that we lift to you in the silence of our hearts. Amen. Friends, hear the promise of the Lord. When you call on me, I will answer. I will satisfy you with life and show you my saving love. This is the good news of God's reconciling love. In the name of Jesus Christ, you and I are forgiven. Thanks be to God. And since we've been forgiven in Christ, let us also forgive one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Glory be to the Father and to the Friends, we're in week four of our Lenten series, and our sermon series is titled Passport, as we move from Ash Wednesday to the cross of Calvary. So far, we've heard from the Apostle Paul, who has written to the churches at Rome and Philippi and Corinth. We've heeded instructions to follow the example of Christ and to learn from others who are doing the same, those who are providing examples of how to live for us. We've also been instructed to learn from examples of how not to live. Along with the Corinthians, we were warned to avoid falling into the same traps as our ancestors, the people of Israel, who were prone to complaint and idolatry and sexual immorality. Today, we will open the scriptures to Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth. He's writing to a primarily Gentile audience and is attempting to address some tensions that have developed within the church. Actually, it's more than likely that this is the third or even fourth correspondence that Paul has written to this congregation. You see, false teachers have led them astray. The church rebelled against Paul's leadership. After all, his suffering and hardship in life must have meant that God did not approve of Paul or his teachings. And so Paul writes a severe or a tearful letter to them to set them to rights. He writes that their rebellion against him is actually rebellion against the gospel. And Paul changes his itinerary and visits Corinth to deal with this issue directly. Afterward, he writes to help set things to rights, to reestablish his authority as a leader, and to instruct them on how to move forward. In our scripture portion for today, Paul delivers a dense theological treatise on how believers ought to view one another, how they ought to live, how they ought to minister to each other, and why it matters. Before we dive in, friends, let's pray. Let's ask God to be our teacher today. And so God, that is our prayer, that you would come and be our teacher, not with the words of a human, but through your living word. And by the power of your Holy Spirit, open our eyes to see and our ears to hear the truth as it points to Jesus. And having encountered our risen Lord today, may we never be the same. I ask this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, hear the word of the Lord from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul writes from... From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. 
Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 2 Corinthians is, is one of the Apostle Paul's most personal letters. He's been discredited and hurt by many in the congregation. And so his appeal to reconciliation here is especially powerful. It's not some random, it's a good thing to do. Paul is attempting to practice what he's preaching. In these scriptures, I think that Paul does three things for his readers. Number one, he gives them a new perspective. Number two, he gives them a renewed purpose. And number three, he gives them a new identity. So first, uh, Paul gives the church in Corinth a new perspective. This is one of Paul's most famous teachings. If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away and see, everything has become new. This is one of those sermon in a sentence lines that captures the gospel message succinctly. Paul writes that followers of Jesus no longer see the world the same way as they did before. And when encountering something like this, we, we might ask ourselves, well, where else in scriptures have we heard about this new creation? If you're like me, Genesis immediately comes to mind, right? Uh, it's literally an account of new creation. Some of you all might, might think of the book of Revelation in which John envisions a new heaven and a new earth, a holy city in which God's presence freely dwells. A deeper cut would be Isaiah 65. Paul's words echo this hope-filled prophecy that God is about to create new heavens and a new earth. Here, Isaiah pictures a world free from disease and premature death, free from economic exploitation. Even natural-born predators live together without fear. While Isaiah's words are echoed here, what sets Paul apart is that his words are in the present tense. For those living in Christ, there is new creation. Neither Isaiah's vision nor John's has been realized. And yet, Paul speaks with confidence about the already but not yet new creation. I imagine it's easier for most of us to name the not yet in our world. Far more difficult is to name and embody where the already places are, those places where new creation is already breaking in. And yet, Paul calls upon us to do just that, to change our perspective and to see new creation all around us. Just as Christ was once experienced and viewed from a human perspective and is now viewed as the risen Lord, so now every Christian is to be viewed in a different light. We often use Paul's words in our worship services as an assurance of pardon. God reminds us that our old way of life, our sin and our shame has passed away, and through God's mercy and grace, we are forgiven. We are made new. Thanks be to God. And while that's certainly praiseworthy, it gets even better. What God through Christ has done changes not only how we see ourselves, but how we see others as well. Every person has value because they are in Christ. Regardless of their response to the gospel, regardless of how they're choosing to live, regardless of their socioeconomic status, Christ died for them. And therefore, they are worthy of respect and care. We are valuable because Christ died for us. Seeing others from the perspective of new creation means that we are given a new purpose, the ministry of reconciliation as ambassadors of Christ. Christ's love claims us for God and also pushes us outward toward others. God's love acted first. We love because God loved us. And now we are free and compelled to love others in the same way. We see others as new creations and are drawn to see them reconciled with God and each other. The word for reconciliation is one of exchange. It's, it would be used in business for money changers, exchanging equivalent values between currencies. It also carries the meaning of adjusting to, of a difference, of 
restoration of favor, of making things right. Recon reconciliation is a not this but that sort of a word. Here in Paul's context, it certainly involves exchanging one way of life for another, but it also involves limits. It sets boundaries on the actions that are fitting or appropriate. One commentator wrote this, Love scrutinizes the options for action and rules and rules out those that are not advantageous or beneficial for others. In other words, sometimes reconciliation is hard work. It's a labor of love. And sometimes being reconciled to others means doing the hard work of becoming aware of things about ourselves that need to change. It can also mean pointing out the same in others before true reconciliation can happen. Because it's a labor of love. Reconciliation often means setting limits and saying no because we know saying yes would be hurtful and unwise. And this work matters because when we get it right, we are ambassadors for Christ. People can see the way we love each other and fight for reconciliation. And seeing how good it is to follow Jesus, people catch a glimpse of a new way of life and they can be reconciled to God. And this work matters because when we get it wrong, we are ambassadors for Christ. People see our dysfunction and want nothing to do with God, new creation or not. It's pretty scary, right? I mean, not even saints fully shed the human point of view, one commentator wrote, but we can all rest confident in a love that loves even enemies. Seeing others from the perspective of new creation, participating in the ministry of reconciliation, and being Christ's ambassadors gives us a new identity as the righteousness of God. Paul writes that Christ who was without sin was made to be sin. In other words, Christ was made to be sin so that we could be made to be righteous. His self-sacrificial death and resurrection have made redemption possible. We can be reconciled to God now. Those who place their trust and faith and hope in Christ, those who confess He is Lord and believe in Him, have been granted a new identity, the righteousness of God. Notice that this is not our righteousness. It's God's. It's nothing we could have attained or earned or achieved on our own. It's all about God and not about us. And in grateful response to, to the righteousness that has been conferred upon us, we share the good news of God's reconciliation with others. Richard War writes this, Dawning is a new creation, not simply the creation of a converted individual with a new outlook on life, but something new breaking into the world, a sphere of existence where participants in Christ experience the fullness of God's new creation, the anticipated renewal of the world. This is how, Paul says, God has brought about reconciliation, a new alignment between the redemptive purposes of God and humanity. You see, you and I are more than simply new creations with a new perspective. We're also ambassadors, reconcilers, and redeemers. We are the righteousness of God breaking into the world. We are participating with God's mission in the world to call others to reconcile, repent, and turn back to God. From a human standpoint, this makes no sense. From a human standpoint, we should look out for ourselves and look to our own needs, and yet we no longer see things from a human perspective, but rather as a new creation. In the kingdom of God, reconciliation and redemption is our mission. It's what we do. It's who we're becoming. We love our enemies because we were once enemies of God. We seek reconciliation with one another because we've been reconciled to God. We offer forgiveness because we've been forgiven. We give because God has given us so much. We love because God first loved us. And so the question today is, what kind of ambassador of Christ are you? And what kind of ambassador would you like to be? Friends, may, may you be reconciled to God. May you live as new creation. May you be Christ's ambassador in every sphere of life. And I ask this in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Return to me with your whole heart, says the Lord. As we enter the season of Lent, may we bring all of who we are back to God. For God is gracious and merciful, abounding in steadfast love, constantly pursuing relationship with us. As our offering is received this day, may our monetary gifts be only the beginning of what we offer to God. May the abundance of God's love open our hearts, our habits, and our minds to the goodness that is all around us. I invite you to give your tithes and offerings using the link that's at the bottom of your screen, or you can send them by mail to our church office. Church, let us pray together. We offer you these gifts, O oh God, knowing that nothing can compare with the gift of life you offer us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Use these gifts and use our lives to proclaim the saving power of Christ's death and resurrection as we press on toward the goal for the prize of your heavenly call. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Today in this house, for all sinners and saints, we come to you, God, to pray for your wisdom and your grace. In Christ, we are a new creation. Open our hearts when they are small. When we hear the sound of music and dancing, but we choose to stay outside, help us to expand our outlook and bring us into the rhythms of your abundance. In Christ, we are a new creation. Open our hands when they are clenched too tightly. When we sing the songs of nationalism more than we do the hymns of your praise, may we reach out to those who have left all they know, afraid of where they come from and unsure of where they're going. In Christ, we are a new creation. Open our eyes when we would rather keep them closed, when we look away from our neighbor instead of looking for ways to help. Sharpen our vision so that we may see them from far away and search for clothes and shoes and food to greet them. In Christ, we are a new creation. God, open our minds when they are shut, blocked by the certainty of our own opinion rather than exposed to your radical love and grace. Help us to be agents of your reconciling peace regarding no one from our human point of view, but with the mind of Christ. In Christ, we are a new creation. We pray all these things and so much more in the way that Jesus taught his disciples to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So friends, may you be reconciled to God. May you live as new creation. May you be Christ's ambassador in every sphere of life. To that end, my friend, receive God's blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May God's face shine brightly upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.